Good evening, mga lagan. So we will continue with our discussion on uh, design of a one-story wood frame building. Now our topic for today are framing plans. So we will um, draw framing plans for our um, sample uh, project. So we will have roof framing plan and then uh, this mezzanine floor framing plan here. And then we will also discuss the load path because uh, it is important when you do framing plan, you have to consider uh, the um, the flow of the like all the forces from the very top. So if you have roof, then down to the how it is transferred, like all the roof loads, how it is transferred to the supporting walls, and then from the walls, if you have um, second floor, or in this case we have mezzanine floor, then the loads on the on the walls near the mezzanine would pass through the floor assembly and then from the floor assembly back to the lower uh, load bearing walls again then from the main floor load bearing walls down to your foundation so we will uh, first uh, do some um roof framing plan so If we if we have our so this is our um I'll just draw separately just the roof right so this is sixty feet and then this is eighty feet now in in um, roof framing in roof thrust construction your thrust should span. Um, if this is a, like a regular building, but we will discuss later like what are other considerations when you uh, design this kind or when you lay out the roof framing plan. So this is our uh, roof truss direction, like in the short, short direction, because that would provide or that would give the most uh, economical um, roof truss section. But there are times that um, you have to span the, the other direction. For example, if this is the front. So if this is the front, this one here, if this is the front of the building, usually it have or it has a lot of like opening, like windows, or if you have curtain walls, doors. So it's um it's common that at the front of your building you will have lots of openings and then for example if you have openings is like really wide opening and then when you span the jo or the truss or the joist in this direction right that would produce a like a large reaction to your or a large large load to your beam now if you have curtain walls and then you have say 30 feet span beam and then that that wall is a load bearing wall and it's transferred to the beam so that's a lot of load and then you consider the deflection so just imagine how much deflection that is say 30 feet opening so your other option is either cut the cut this span by half right here and then provide some kind of like intermediate columns but if you don't have or you don't have room for columns and the client wants that like all the way open so what you can do is what you can do is is either if if this is this opening here if this opening here if you cannot put column in the middle your other option is also to have a like a column here, a column here, and then have a beam in that direction or girder truss, and then span your truss in this direction. So you can also do that. Because you may save a um, few hundred dollars on the roof framing plan if you span in the shorter direction. But it would cost you a lot 
and then you will have problems with your um, um, curtain walls or you have large opening storefront with regards to like you have to allow say what if the the required or the maximum reflection say L over um, uh, 360 and then it would it would result into a say two inches of deflection or one inch deflection so you have a lot of like uh, clearance required between your beam and your curtain wall that would be difficult to I mean it can be done but it would be difficult for the um, for the architectural portion or part of the building like design that would be difficult so that's why when you do preliminary layouts you have to coordinate with the architects and basically um usually the architect will just give you okay this is our concept this is the um this is what we want this is what the client wants you have to coordinate with uh, other disciplines and then for the uh, other uh, say mechanical also if they have rooftop unit then you can consider that when you um when you lay out your framing so this this layout here with a girder truss with girder truss right here and then expand the joist uh, say if this is north this is uh, south this is west this is east so you can expand your process west to east right so that's your option but the first first uh, first option should be your roof thrust is span in the short direction because that would be the most economical um section and then if that won't work structurally and then it would create more complications on your framing then that's the time you would uh, consider uh, spanning the joint or the joist or the trusses in the opposite direction so in this case for example i mean this is just an example we have um we have an opening here so our our uh, let's just uh, erase this one here so in our example so this is 60 and then we only have opening here which is 10 feet and then we have 25 foot opening here and i mean this is just an example and then we have say let's just add um on the on the mezzanine floor level we'll just add few windows here so few windows so say this is um four feet span so again this one this is 10. this is at the front like the the entrance like vestibule this is the vestibule here and then this is 25 feet opening so in this case since we have a huge opening on the east wall then this time it is economical if we span the joist we will avoid trying to make this opening here a load bearing although it will be a load bearing it will get a small portion of the, the roof but not a pure like a uh, load bearing like for the for the trusses itself like the main truss so what we can do is we will span the joist or the trusses in this direction so it is economical this way and then this is 60 feet so if the architects allows a column like interior column then it is also cheaper to just use that column and then um uh have a shorter trusses that way Usually, when when uh, there are times that you are restricted with your building height, so what if your trusses say, um, or your building height maximum height allowed is only twenty feet, twenty feet, and then the clients wanted a sixteen foot or uh, eighteen foot uh, wall. Now, if that's 18 foot wall and we only have 20 foot maximum height of your roof level, then that means including the roof assembly and then the roof trusses, that's only two feet 
right? That's only two feet, 24 inches. So if you simply say eight inches, then what? How much is left? Like 16 inches for the truss, that's, and then expanding 60 feet, that's, that's uh, impossible, right? So this time, if this is the case, you would uh, coordinate like, okay, say the minimum truss required is say 36, 36 inches. So that would reduce your uh, floor to ceiling height. And then if the clients uh, would say, okay, can we can we make it a little bit higher? Say it turns out that the based on 36 inches uh, um, roof thrust depth and then plus eight inches, so that's 42, right? So that would uh, reduce your that would reduce your uh, clearance. Now. If you say, okay, then can we make it 16, 16 feet? Now, if the if the owner is okay with 16 feet floor to ceiling height, then you have to find a way that this will work so that it will not exceed the 20 feet um, maximum height, right? Especially if uh, you are near an airport, that's where you are usually restricted with your building height because of course like you know you know you, uh, the, the airplane needs uh, more uh, airspace so those are the the things that you need to consider when you do a roof framing plan so first is um, of course your first is consider expanding the roof thrust in the shorter in the shortest direction and then if that won't work then find another way expand it the other side and then if you if there are large opening then maybe it's better to avoid that as your load bearing wall then expand the trusses to the other direction as well so there are lots of things to consider when you do a framing you cannot just do like framing okay ah this is what i what i like i will do framing i will span the trusses this way this way right you have to consider the the your your client the owner and also if it's easier to um, usually, we what the what the owner uh, understand is money. So, if you start your if you start your uh, argument that this is the cheapest way, then most likely they would go for it. So, with going back to this uh, example here. So this is our process, right now. If this is the intra, uh, this is the end wall. So if that is your end wall, right? Now, usually, if this is just like um, with with there's no overhang, right? So if 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 you, if you look at the cross section, if this is your wall, and then this is your your trusses here, right? If you cut section that way. Now, if there is no cantilever here, you can have your last truss above your end wall, right? But if there is cantilever, if there is overhang, say two, usually, um, if um, the the if it's sharp, most likely it's just straight. But uh, if it's like a, an office or a a commercial retail unit, it would require a like a cantilever around the perimeter. So on this one, in this in on this side, for example, this is your cantilever or the overhang, the edge of the roof outline. And it is say two feet or three feet. No? Three feet offset from the perimeter. Now on these trusses, if we expand the trusses this way, all you have to do is just extend the Trust that way, right? Just extend the trust. Now, if you look at that in in the section, say for example, this is your this is your wall, and then this is your top plate, and then this is your truss. All you have to do is just extend. Extend your truss. Now, if this 
this overhang is say this truss is say 36 and then the architectural drawing this only requires like 12 right 12 inches so what you can do is you'll just show it in your layout that this is this is the the required roof truss section and then once the truss manufacturer receives your drawing look at it and say okay there is a like a, 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 a an overhang which is uh, three feet uh, around the perimeter and then the depth is only um 12 inches then what you what what you can do when you do the the detail is you can extend the you can extend the top cord and then just frame this part here like that and this is 12 12 inches right so whatever is the uh whatever is the uh the the architectural like uh whatever is shown the architectural plan if they say okay this is only 12 inches or if this is six inches then you can just uh extend just the top cord without this framing and then just put a like a fascia board right so and then this bottom cord terminates at the at the end of the wall or at the top of the wall so you can do something like that now in this case this is only good if your wall is perpendicular to your truss so what if our wall is parallel to the truss direction now one way to frame this one is so this is if your wall is perpendicular to the trusses this one right so this is if the wall is perpendicular to the truss now we will do the same um framing but this time it is the end wall so for end wall for end wall our truss is parallel right so this is So this is your wall, and then this is your truss, one. Now, some, sometimes, you, what you can do is extend this wall all the way to the um, level, like underside of the, um, do this one again. So if this is the wall, you can frame that one all the way to the underside of the top cord and then run a like an outrigger like that. So that's one one way of framing this one. Extend the wall all the way and then just run a like an outrigger like that, say two by four or two by six, it depends on your design. Right? Then another another way to frame this one is what we call the reduced in truss. And this is what I usually do because um if we if we extend the the, the trusses all the way to the underside of the bottom cord and then directly support the the outrigger by that wall, that means I need a much taller say if this is at 16 feet then i will need say 19 19 foot or more um stud and the longer it is the more expensive it is. that would be a special cut i think um uh, most of the time when i when i do like this one i talk to the contractor and i will always ask like can you get a stud this this long and sometimes if they say okay i can get up to 16 then you have to find a way that uh, this stud can only spot 16 because you cannot splice a you cannot splice a i mean you can splice your stud but that would be really expensive because you have to avoid that hinge effect so for example if this is your if this is your um wall and then you are you are having like a splice right here because this is your 16 foot mark 16 foot and then to make it 20 you will you will splice it with four 
Now this this one this will create a hinge effect, no? Hinge effect. So it would uh, if you apply the load, this is exaggerated, but um, it would look like, like that one, right? So you have to reinforce this portion. There are times that um, I will I will uh, I have no other option but to splice a stud. Then what I will do is, if this is a, this is our upper portion, right? And then this is our lower portion here. Then what I will do is, I will have a, a strap both side, no? Simpson strap. Uh, sometimes if it's uh, whatever is the required um, length. Uh, in STA, say 24 or in STA, I'm talking about Simpson products. Uh, in STA, uh, 36, you know, in STA 48 or the pole straps. So you can do that. that would be that would be expensive. So another way of framing this one, so so that you don't you don't need a really tall uh, stud, is using a thrust like on top of your wall so if this is your if this is your wall so this is your top plate and then this is your um other side of ceiling and then you have your trusses here right one way to frame that one is to have like a what we call a reduced interest so it's the same uh it, it would be the same like pre-engineered truss but shorter or uh yeah shorter in in depth and then you can run your outrigger here but in this case you also you also have like a hinge effect here but since it is aligned with the with the um underside of your truss your bottom cord what you can do is just add a bracing there so you add a bracing and then if you don't have ceiling here that could trans that could act as a diaphragm then you have to transfer this load back to your roof diaphragm so that's why sometimes we we would recommend like to add a bracing in the direction so that any reaction say if this is if this is your wind load right so the bottom would be supported by the foundation like laterally but the very top no, the very top you have to transfer that load back to the roof diaphragm. So if there is no, uh, say there is no plywood on your ceiling or there is no OSB, then you have to transfer that load back to the roof, and then from the roof back to your top plate on the the load bearing side, and then down to the foundation. So we will discuss later the the load path, but this this one will just do the framing first. So it's either uh, like having a blocking all the way here and then use that um, ceiling as your diaphragm. If there's none, then you have to transfer that back to the roof um, sheathing uh, acting as a diaphragm. So you can, you can do this one. So it's either this way or you have a wall extended all the way to the underside of your trigger but this this will be a problem if 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 it ended up uh like a really tall if it's only say if your wall is only like 10 feet and then your truss is only two feet then that would require a 12 feet uh that then you can get that easily uh at the at the hardware store or at the um sawmill so those are things that uh, you need to consider now another another one is what will you do with if you have a an overhang and then what will you do with uh like at the corner so let's have another so for now we will just uh we will just um make a like a blow up of your uh wall corner so if this is your wall all right so this is your wall and then your truss extending extending there like that 
so this is just like a a um blow up of your wall corner so say we are we are talking about this corner here right so if you blow up that corner it would look like this one now we have our our triggers also going in this direction right we have the triggers and then we have the we have the reduced interest like that now what will you do with this corner this one what i usually do is i will uh, have a like a um an outrigger at say 45 degrees supported by this um let's align with the let's align with the um top of the interest so what i will do is i will uh i will run a like an outrigger here at 45 degrees and then i will uh, i will have my another outrigger there like that and then at this end you can have your like um fascia supported by this outrigger here as well as this side will be supported by outrigger like one end and then the other end here would be supported by this diagonal outrigger sometimes you uh um you can do a framing like that if it is flat roof and then uh, or not even not just flat roof even if it's like a gable you can do the same and then yeah so another another way also this is just like at the very at the very end right uh or the the, the very first truss from from your wall you can also this do the same if um like you would extend all the way say three trusses uh, trusses spaces um if this is your wall so if this is your wall here and then your your truss your you can you can call this one as girder truss like that and then your instead of an outrigger you will have a a short uh, truss and then if you look at the section it would look like that one so this is your top cord this is your uh, in post like that diagonal and then you will have your um top plate here for your wall and then this will be attached to your girder truss this one so your girder truss would be this so you will have a girder truss it could be one ply or it can be two plies it depends on the design of the truss manufacturer so you can do a framing like that one and then at the corner all you have to do is extend this also like a the same the same uh, profile as this one but diagonally and then you will have a girder tra uh, a short truss here and then again your fascia supported by your trusses so you can you can do like uh, you can offset this like say uh, six feet especially if you are if you have opening at the corner and then you will try to avoid that the uh, big reaction so for example if if this ends up having a like a like an opening at the corner right so if you want to avoid that uh, corner to be um load bearing like huge concentrated load then what you can do is offset your offset your truss right here and then you will just do this one here i mean if this is a corner like opening you must have like a column here at the corner then use that as part of your truss so you can do something like that one so on this one since uh, in our our drawing we don't have we don't have a a an overhang but we have parapet so to frame that one if you have a parapet so this is your so this is your wall this is your wall right this is your top plate two ply top plate usually it's two ply 
and then um, so what you can do is at the at the very end or your load bearing wall this one the side walls that's fine because you can just like i said you can just extend your trusses but on the end walls what you can do is um so this is your wall and then these are your trusses right so you can do this uh no not not all the way so what you can do is have your truss like that one and then uh this is your bottom cord and then this is your this is your top cord right and then just extend your king post just extend that one like that so you have to um at least draw a like a profile of the truss but at the end of the day when you submit this to the truss manufacturer they, they will only use this as a guide so they can probably change your truss configuration but as long as uh it matches with your profile um for example you draw this as this spacing here is say four feet and then they say okay we have to make that closer like three feet or whatever but as long as the uh, the the profile the geometry of your truss where you have a parapet here right then um that's fine uh they can do whatever they want as long as it matches what's important is it matches your uh, profile it matches your direction you have to make sure that the truss direction in their shop drawing matches with your uh rough framing plan because like i said in 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 when we we discuss about loading you no know? so when we discuss we discuss about loading you had your trusses in this direction and then this is of course this will be your main load bearing wall and then when when the truss uh shape drawing came and uh his layout he spun the truss in this direction now that changes the load bearing wall that changes the your main uh, foundation wall so you know it it screwed your um design so you have to make sure that uh, whatever when you receive the um shape drawing it matches with your uh, row framing plan so we now have the different like way of framing the wall but like i said this is a flat roof no overhang and then with a parapet so we have parapet in our sample i think that was two feet or was that two feet yeah so all you can do all you have to do is just make a truss like this one and then um this is your so this is your girder truss here oh. this is your girder truss Right, maybe two ply or one ply, and then this will be your regular truss perpendicular to your uh, um, board. So you can do like this one, and actually, this is what I I usually do when I do framing, uh, rough framing plan and details when I cut sections. This is what I typically show in my plan, and then this way you have. Like for your walls, you have uniform height of your walls, then it's easy to just it, it's easy to build that way. And then you don't have to uh buy a really long um stud and that will be expensive. So if you if you limit your um wall up to say 12, then uh, those uh length you can buy easily at um any hardware store like Home Depot, Home Hardware, no? so you can buy those um, um, length. But if it's more than that, then you might end up buying at the sawmill itself directly, and then it will cost uh, maybe double. It's 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 quite expensive if you go um, more than the usual uh, length. So that's our 
um, frame rock framing plan. Now for the for the mezzanine floor. So if we go back to our plan, so we have this mezzanine which is thirty foot wide, and then the whole depth of your sixty feet uh, of your building. So if you cut section, if you cut section here this way, uh, that one, looking uh, looking up. What you can do is for the for the so we have the joist here. So obviously we will expand the joist this way. It's just like makes sense if you expand the joist in this direction so you don't have you don't need extra beams. Otherwise if you expand the joist in this direction then you will have you will need intermediate beams. Right? So what you can do is you since you already have beams here and you have columns you are allowed to have columns here this way then we will just span the joist in this direction it's it's uh, a 30 feet um mm -hmm. maybe we will decide later i think we cannot uh, i don't know if we can span 30 feet um we'll do quick uh, calculation so if you go to 40 because um in 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 actual practice as well um if you have a span like this one you will do like a prelim calculation like how much uh if i will clear this whole uh span 30 feet what would be the required uh joist depth or maybe you uh you will uh, propose a instead of a TG, say tgi joist uh, you will propose a uh, floor truss, open web uh, wood truss to give you an idea what it looks like. It's not common here, but when I did um, projects in the US before, um, we seldom use uh, TGI. We most of our projects are using open web truss because that's easier for all the for, um, for all the. Um, Electrical for or the plumbing because you can it's it's open web so you can pass through uh, your um, pipes, you no, know, your ducts so it's easy rather than having a solid PGI joist and then when you run your ducts you have to have a bulkhead underneath so open web images. So yeah, these are the um, these are the sample of open web trusses. This one here. Oh, it's really slow. This one. See, you see this um, portion here in the middle. This one here with um, opening. So that is intended for ducts. So you can the mechanical can pass the ducts in this direction. Or you can have, if, if the duct is small, like say 12 inches or 8 inches, then most likely, because uh, for for um, open web trusses, uh, for example, the open web steel joist, uh, for different depth, they have recommended um, maximum diameter for the duct that can pass through the web. But on this, on this particular product, they have a, like a rectangular opening here intended for the rectangular ducts uh, most likely this is like what maybe 24 inch wide um duct so that's that's a lot of room for your ducts and then you your plumbing can run through this uh, web here so so these are your uh this um one of your options when you do your floor framing if if it requires like really really long um here i think i we only did maybe one or two projects that uses this one. Um, I think, yeah, they are not, uh, I don't know, like, um, it has something to do with like fire um, protection. Because this one, of course, uh, if you need the uh, fire rating, then this is open. So I don't know, I, I don't know about fire, uh, fire rating calculations, but 
um, this is what I usually hear from uh, from the architectural uh, point of view when I when I discuss about something like this one. I don't know when I did all those projects in in the U.S. I don't know what they did with uh, with regards to fire um, rating or fire separation, but um, maybe it it was not that uh, strict at uh, at the time because it was what two thousand. 2005 to 2009 yeah 2009 so with the energy requirements uh, especially this uh, revision of the national building code it's quite uh, um, strict and uh, so maybe that's 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 the reason why they don't want this opening but this is an option structurally um i would prefer this one because i hate I hate uh, specifying joys, and then uh, when uh, when the plumbers uh, do their stuff, they will just cut the 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 joist, you know. Even if even if in my detail I would uh, in in my detail I always include the uh, allowable uh, joist uh, holes locations uh, based on the um, um, if you look at this uh, um catalog from warehouser products like TGI uh, let's see where is it they have a this one so I always include in my detail I always include this this part here this one I always include this one and then depending on the joist depth and then uh, the allowable holes like sizes and locations and then most of the time the plumbers I don't know for some reason they would just do their thing and then don't mind and then when i do the inspection that's where i found out that okay this is not working and you know it's it's a it's a headache going back to our framing plan so So we are done with the we are done for now with the roof framing layout. So we already uh, have an idea how how to frame the roof, right? So we'll go with the floor. So assuming, oh no, I said we will do a quick calculation on the joist if it works. So this is our uh, this. So this is forty web, right? So this is what I use when I size the the members. And then this floor joist here, and then supports. Uh, we will discuss later um, what can what can we do with this side here, the left side. But on the right side, that is where the beam is, right? So the span is 30, 30 feet. Is this commercial? Um, yeah. So make sure that uh, if this is like a like an assembly or like a, like aside from residential, if if other than residential, you have to consider a um um you will uh, you have to choose the commercial um for the default commercial load because that would uh, include the extra two thousand pounds like this one here concentrated along like this uh, every every foot on your um choice and uh, the the program will uh, run that uh, concentrated load otherwise if you set this one as a residential then um um you can find that one if you add uh, a level here so when you add level here, here the building class this one so you have the option of uh, selecting this into a like a residential and commercial i don't know why it's not showing commercial here yeah so commercial or residential so if this is other than uh, residential you have to select the commercial i mean of course uh, you have to look at the actual uh, assembly but most of the time if it's not residential just consider it commercial and then that would include the concentrated load so we'll do that one so you have to make sure that you do that selection prior to adding these members. Otherwise, you cannot change that one once you already have started designing this one. Uh, let's see. 
see if you already have members on your um on your assigned level then you cannot select this uh, building class anymore so you have to do that selection before starting calculating your because it happened to me once and it was a it was a painful uh, lesson because i already did um I think at least 20 calculations here, like 20, I already designed like 20 members, different members. And then I realized this, this was uh, assigned to a residential class and the concentrated load was not included in the analysis. So I have no other choice but to delete all the calculations and like redo, redo the uh, member design. So remember you have to do that before now, when you add a level, you have to do that uh, uh, selection before adding any members, like in your in your uh, design. So for the floor joist, so our span. Now support one, this one here, support one. You have this number here, one, this one, and then on the right you have number two, and then this is the um like a properties of your uh, support one, and then on the right support two. And then if you have another span, say 15, then it would add another support we have, which is support tree. And then this is your um, property of your uh, support tree. But uh, we don't have support uh, uh, or sequence span at this time. So we will just assume that there's a clear span. And then on support one, um we have two options on support one actually win uh for the framing uh for the floor framing or any wood framing we do have uh two types of framing uh the first one is called um uh platform platform framing and the other one is balloon so what it means is if this is a platform framing you have your lower walls here this one this is your lower load bearing walls and then you have your rim board and then you have your you have your floor joist like that and then your bottom plate of your upper wall so that is platform framing. Now balloon framing, balloon framing is if you have a continuous wall all the way from the foundation all the way to the roof, and then your joist will be hanging using a ledger. So it's either your joist at the top, or you will have a face mount uh, hanger here, like a joist. Now this is your ledger. So this is your ledger, ledger board. And then this is your joist. And then you can either uh, use a top mount hanger or a um, face mount hanger. Or other option is you have your ledger at the bottom and then your joist at the top. But that's, that's called the balloon framing. And um, balloon framing is fine if your joist span is like say maybe up to 10 feet long. That's fine because the reaction is uh, not that much and then especially if it's a uh, residential construction. So you only have like 40 PSF for your um, live load. Um, that's 1.9 kilopascal versus a commercial where occupancy live load is usually 100 psf or 4.8 kilopascal so imagine in this particular project we have 30 foot span joist and then 100 psf live load and then you do this one i can't imagine the the fastener required to fa i don't even know if it will work but uh, imagine the amount of uh, fasteners like either nails or screws uh, attaching your ledger to your studs so that's why for longer span, it's always better to use the platform framing. 
and then it's also cheaper because you you will need a shorter uh, studs rather than say if this is 16 foot high then you have your um floor at say mid height then you only need like at most eight foot uh stud right instead of having a required uh, the 16 foot uh, stud that would be um expensive so on this one so you have to decide which what kind of framing but um i would suggest uh just use the um platform framing especially if it's a uh, long span joist so with that said going back to our java course our 40 web so assuming this is uh, a 2 by 6 wall then the demi the 2 by 6 dimension number the dress size is 5.5 inches so this one here so again um for your support one this one this is the load bearing wall here 5.5 and then the beam um say this is at least three ply so three ply is what five because el engineered wood is uh especially in wheels typically one and three quarter inch wide then you have three ply so this is 5.25 inches that one now like i said if this is um if this is uh if your beam is below the floor like that then you lost this clearance here so that's why it's better to flush the beam with the joist so either use a face mount hanger or a top mount hanger that's fine it, it's up to you so in this case so you have this um the spans and supports like already specified 30 foot span clear out to out right and then uh, now let's go to the loads the member info will uh this this one here the code minimum deflection criteria um if this is just like a regular like there's no sensitive like a uh, material uh, that requires like a st more stringent uh, um deflection criteria then just use the code minimum so if you select this high imagine the live load is 600 l over 600 right this is um L over 600 is usually the reflection criteria for if you have like uh, overhead cranes. And then for improve, you have L over 480. So um, this is critical if this, for example, if you're, if you're, uh, if you have a ceiling that is attached directly to the underside of the joist, and then um, uh it doesn't have much tolerance with regards to deflection then you can increase that criteria um so that uh you will not exceed the the allowable uh, deflection for the for your um if you have dry walls or something like that but if you have a t-bar ceiling where you have a suspended ceiling right then you don't need that one you just you just have to select the the code minimum because even if the joist uh, deflects then you still have that um clearance between the um the other side of the joist and the and the t-bar ceiling so and then this one here is a lot of uh, member settings a lot of with stiffeners at end supports then yeah you can select that one and then allow tgi with stiffeners at inter this is on this will only um apply if it is really required if it's not required then it will not specify a wave stiffener then allow TGI cantilever enforcement. Yeah, you can check that one. Allow re repetitive member increase for rectangular joist products only. Then this one is uh, allow removal of supports with excessive up left. So this will happen if that one will happen if, for example, um, you have a so you have this floor joist, right? And then uh, you have a load bearing wall here. And then you have a perimeter beam here. And then another load bearing wall here. If this is, um, if this is say, this is 20 feet and then this is five, five feet. There's a chance that the, the elastic curve of the, 
um, joist because this is way longer than the the backspan is way longer than the um, cantilever. There's a chance that the joist uh, this is exaggerated, but there's a chance that it would um, behave like that one after the load is applied. Or if you look at the if you look at the um, elastic curve, it would look like that one. So instead of the usual instead of the usual deflection like that one, instead of the usual deflection like that, but because this is way longer than the cantilever, sometimes the joist would deflect this way, like that will behave like that. So in this case, you have a you have an uplift at the very end. So if you select. If you select this one here, uh, if you check this one, allow removal, that means that means when when it analyzes this joist, once you have a net uplift at the very end, it would release the support and then transfer all the load to this remaining load bearing walls. And then if not, if you don't check that one, that means this beam will resist the uplift and then hold the joist together then in that case you have a you have an uplift at the very end right here and then on your joist so uh most likely you have to select a joist that can resist um so when you attach the b uh, the joist to the beam so when you attach the joist to the beam you have to find a joist hanger that can resist both downward and uplift because you you don't allow any um uh, release of the um uplift here if it's really it's really high so you have to find a joist and sometimes if you do it that way um it's hard to find um a joist uh, that can resist that one if you can find it will be uh, it will be expensive so yeah so you have to find a joist and then your beam itself you have to um consider also for the uplift of your beam then that way um if you have your beam if you have your beam here and then you have your column support you have to make sure that at this connection here it can resist the uplift. So if it's just vertical, then maybe you don't need a, a post cut. You just nail that one. But if there's a like a huge uplift because you don't release this joist here, then you have to provide a some kind of a um, connector. Uh, Simpson Products has lots of connectors for that uh, application. And um, so going back to Forte, so allow removal, uh, we, you can opt that as uh, like uncheck or you can have it checked. So for now, we'll just say, uh, we'll just un uncheck that one. So you don't allow any uplift and then we'll, we'll, we'll find, uh, uh, not in this case because we don't have a, this is just a single span, so it doesn't matter. We don't have cantilever as well. So for the loads, so dead load. Now this dead load, this is for your um, floor assembly. So in, in previous videos, we showed you the dead load calculation. So that is basically just the weight of your uh, floor assembly. And then you consider if this is some kind, say, like a classroom, then if your live load turns out to be just 50 instead of 100 then you can add you have to add the partition but if you assume a 100 psf live load i don't typically i don't know with other engineers but if i if my live load is already 100 i don't include the partition load but uh, it's up to you but like i said in my case if, if the load is already 100, I don't uh, include the partition. 
because that means for for 100 psf that's like an, an assembly area that's an open area and uh, there's gonna be no partition in there anyway so say our dig load is 20 and then flow live load is say 100 that's our occupancy live load and then of course we don't have snow which that's a floor we don't have wind and then we don't have seismic and then this one this is it's in the code you can you consider two thousand pounds and then holes location floor performance now this one you can select what kind of um uh floor breaking you have so if it's like a plywood or a like a it's gold this one it's gold panel this is osb it's gold and this is osb um des uh, designed for um floor digging so before uh osb are not are not um are not recommended for floor floor like a subfloor because uh, it has less capacity with regards to um out of plane bending uh, compared to a plywood but uh, this product here it's gold uh, it has uh, a good capacity for um, out of plane bending and then you select the thickness and then the span rating say uh, 23 over 32 so this is your um, plywood and then um if it's sometimes uh this one actually will uh, matter with regards to like um um vibration your floor per performance and then you will have a a better uh, floor performance if you say select if you select glued and nailed versus nailed only so and then strapping if there is no if there is strapping sometimes you have a you have your floor joist and then you have a a two by four strapping at the underside then you can add that one if there's one a one by four flat two by four flat for strong back and then the ceiling type if it's suspended or if there's a plywood directly attached to that one so it would increase the stiffness of your um stiffness of your um uh floor joist uh for vibration uh, cal calculation and then if you have bridging or blocking between floor joists uh especially this one this is 30 30 feet we definitely need a, a joist uh, blocking on this one at every feet uh, eight feet so we will check on that one and then if there is a um partitions and we don't assume partition so we we have to uncheck this one and then for flooring overlay so if you have a jeep script or a concrete tapping then you check this one so on this case we'll just check the bridging and then glued and nailed so make sure that if this is glued and nailed this matches with your specification so when you when you prepare your specs for your drawing in your drawing you add notes you have to specify that the deck the sub floor should be glued and nailed to the joist because this is what you assume otherwise you'll just uh, select the nailed only and then product selection so this is tgi we are using tgi um commodity lumber this is the dimension lumber see uh, uh different um species douglas fir um uh, hemlock and then uh, we typically um specify this one here is pf number one or two for like a um, short span choice but for longer span uh we use the tgi and then product series this one this is more stiff compared to the other uh, four series so this one has bigger flange i think tjff60 is three and one half wide flange versus this one is like two and a half i think so tji560 and then say the biggest or the the deepest one is 20 because this is 30 feet and then we'll say 16 and then one ply and then we'll see if it passes the analysis So let's wait.
it takes time to analyze because you have that um, imagine uh, you consider that uh, concentrated load so we'll check we will uncheck the concentrate uh, this this portion here and then we'll we'll uh, look at the difference how how uh, fast it can calculate without that concentrated load see if you notice that one this is uh, faster than uh, the one the, the the previous one with concentrated load because in, in when you apply the concentrated load it will calculate also you think do a, a lot of iteration especially this is 30 volt span so it would um, do at least maybe 20 or 30 alterations depending on where the concentrated load uh, is located that will produce a maximum maximum okay. bending or deflection something like that so we will check that again because this is a commercial application so we'll have that uh, concentrated but i was i was just showing you why it takes longer to calculate because of this um, concentrated load so when we run our calculation it failed in Let's check. So it failed in live load deflection. So the allowed deflection is based on your criteria is 0.973 and then the actual is 1.122. And then your bearing is 102%. So it's just above the boundary and uh, the software still allows for that and uh, did not consider it as a fail um, for bearing. And then our shear is fine, then binding is fine. So usually, um, in, in like any other uh, product, if it's the, if your member is just too long, um, most of the time it's the deflection that governs the design. Now this is 37, this TGI Pro rating, this is 40 the allowed and then the the actual is 37 if we change the the pro performance here change this to glued and nail and then take this one and then strapping two by four ceiling type five eight gypsum underneath we'll just check all of this and then compare the result what will happen to the um floor performance So for solutions, see, the actual is 42 and then the allowed is 40. The, this one here is, the allowed is the minimum, minimum requirements. And then our TGI Pro rating is now 42. And then the deflection, this one, L over 25. So if you notice, it increases the uh, stiffness of your joist, then of course, um reduce your deflection but still it is considered as failed now all you have to do is it's either you go double 19 point at uh, uh double joist 19.2 inches on center this one so you go double double spacing See, it's either you go double spacing uh, at 19.2 or you go 12 inches single ply. So it's either you have your um, 20 inch joist at uh, 12 inches on center or you have double joist at 19.2 inches on center. Now you have to decide which one would you specify. Now you have to talk to, uh, usually in this case, you have to talk to the mechanical engineer because he might run a duct in between your joist, parallel, in between your joist. Now imagine if that's 12 inches in center and then you have your flange. So you have a, like, say, at the web, at the web. If that's 12 inches in center, then your clearance between the web is what the Typically, the, the web is 3, 8. So you only have like what? 11 and 5, 8. 11 and 5, 8 uh, clearance. Versus if you have 19.2 minus 3, 8. So you have like what? Around 18.5 inches of clearance. So you have more room for your, for the ducts, for the mechanical. So 
that's why you have to look at the mechanical plan if they have uh, ducks running in between joints like parallel if none then uh, um you can specify 12 or double at 19 it's up to you so another thing to consider is if this is um 12 inches on center single joist you look at the report and then in this report it will show you the joist hanger see so if you specify a beam and then a face mount hanger then it will give you a recommendation for different uh, face mount hanger this one here and then this one we have stiffeners so accessories this means that um at each end of the of the joist at bearing location you need weave stiffeners and remember this weave stiffeners is different from squash block right the squash block is if you have um load bearing above so uh, going back to our drawing let's do a quick uh, discussion with regards to squash block so if this is your if this is your top plate double top plate of your wall so we'll just erase this one so if you have double top plate and then you have your you have your uh, rim board here you have your rim board and then your joist that way and then you have your subfloor and then you have your bottom plate of the upper load bearing wall if this is a load bearing wall now the the the, the stiffener is for the web only that's with the stiffener and that is to increase the bearing capacity of your web otherwise it would buckle but the squash block that is to transfer your load above and bypass the joist imagine if this is your load bearing wall above and then you don't have a squash block what will happen it would crush a portion of the load will be transferred to the rim board and then portion of that would be transferred to your joist and it mean if you did that consider that in your joist analysis otherwise you would uh, when you design the joist you would add in the loadings a concentrated load right here at, at, at the end if that's the case if there's a load bearing wall above and then you don't have um squash block but that would uh, for sure guarantee that would uh, uh cause failure on your joist so that's why if you look at the pgi uh, uh manufacturer this one here recommendation see this one is squash block this one here squash block to tgi joist load bearing wall above so it is um it is above the or it it supports the the load bearing wall above and then bypass the joist so that there is no load transferred to your joist otherwise your joist will fail like it will crush the joist so that's the purpose of the it's squash block this the stiffener is just um increase the stiffness of your web that's why it's called the stiffener so let's see which one here this one here, yeah, the stiffener. So that stiffener, that's basically like clamping your web at the support location, and that would increase the bearing capacity of your web. Otherwise, it would buckle. But uh, the squash blocking is different. See this one here. Um, let's zoom this out. So that's the purpose of the squash block. So we have load bearing wall above. And then this one would bypass. See, you have a gap here of one sixteenth of an inch, so that when the load is applied and it would go shrinkage on your um, squash block, at least when it shrinks, it will not still not uh, touch the top of the joist. When you do, like when you um, specify this kind of uh, detail, uh, like uh, um, squash blocking you have to include this uh, detail that shows a the, the gap bit or the the the, um, the amount of um, gap between the top of the joist and the 
underside or the top of the squash block which is 1 16th of an inch you have to show that one because if you make that flush the same height then it defeats the purpose of having that like the, why we have that it's squash blocking so going back to our um calculation here so for the report so this one will give you the reactions like how much did load is on support one how much uh, like uh, did load is on the hanger and then um, so this is the minimum uh, uh, joist hanger recommended LF uh, 3514 so it, this one here so if if you select a top mount hanger if you go back to the um to the this one here spans and support if you select top mount hanger it will also recommend the different uh, top mount hanger that you can use and this time it is MIT 420 it's different than the uh was that LF something so it depends right so sometimes when you specify something and then uh, that's why before when I when I first uh, joined the company, I frequently visit the um, hardware store and uh, like just look around what are the products available at the store that you can or that I can specify, especially for the Simpson products, uh, for like framing angles or joist hangers. Like the first time I I, I started uh, working at the company, only few were available, like just the standard hangers, and then um, over time we, um, I told the the sales rep that you have to um, make sure that these products are available in the area. So again, so this is yeah joist hanger MI T four four twenty, and then these are the recommended fasteners. And then sometimes when I specify a joist hanger, I will uh, look at these uh, fasteners required. So say MIT 420, uh, seat length is uh, um, 4.5 inch, then top fasteners is 14D, and then face fasteners is uh, 14D as well, and then member fasteners is 14D. Um, these are US uh, sizes, like 10D, uh, penis, 10 penny size. Now, if you select a another joist, remember this is four, 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 two, right? Four, this one for the top fasteners, four, in the for the face fasteners, and then member fasteners. So, if you select another joist hanger, so it says here six in the for top, then face is ten, and then member fasteners is eight. So it means that if you specify this one, you would require more fasteners on your member. So and if if it's only like one one joist or two joists, and then that's fine. But if you are talking about what hundred hundred uh uh joist hangers, then it will add up. No, so that's that's another uh, um thing that to consider when you specify the joist. That's why when you when you um when uh when after you design when you look at this uh um top the hanger uh uh types or available for this particular application the the first one that is, is specified is also is uh, always the cheapest one this one here MIT that's that's the the a most efficient and economical uh, hanger and then if they can find the hanger then that's the time you will specify another one and sometimes i will ask the contractor okay what kind of hanger is available or what kind of hanger can you get uh easily and then if you say okay i can only find this uh, type of hanger and then i will find it in the available or the recommended sizes and then if it's in here then that's fine. If not, then um, I'll have to find a way. So we're already done with the roof framing and then the floor framing. So again, we are fine with expanding the the joist the whole length, but it's 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 uh, it it will be twenty inches uh, joist. But you don't need any load bearing walls below. So 
sometimes uh, the owner wants uh, or likes that one where uh, he can have like really open space at the bottom or at the lower floor so he can play with uh, you know how he he places all the, the the tables and everything so yeah just you just have to work with what the what the owner wants and then if sometimes uh, what he wants uh, um not uh would uh, would result into a like a least efficient design then you can tell him that this is this is what's gonna happen but if he insists on doing what he needs or what he wants then that's fine but you just you just let him know that uh, um if you want this uh to be like that whatever you want then these are the options that uh, we have to do so and then yeah just just uh, discuss it with the clients or the architects whatever and then um so we are done with uh, the roof framing now we will uh we, it's one one and a half hours so we will uh, talk uh, about load path uh, really quick uh this will not take too long all you have to do is make sure that you have a a continuous path with uh, from from the upper level from your roof down to the foundation because all the loads from 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 above has to be um transferred down back to your foundation we will cut section right there so it will show the mezzanine so this is our uh, say this is our roof right and then this is our upper wall and then we have our floor and then we have our lower wall so that's our beam and then right here would be a full height full height wall and then we'll have like um columns and then right here would be our foundation and then we have also if, if it's footing then footing and then here if it's foundation wall like inverted t or pile or grade beam then that's grade beam so from here at this location at this joint we will um, make a bigger detail at that particular joint so this is your roof thrust this is just like a this is without uh, uh we have the parapet here right and then you have your you have your top plate like that now if you remember when we did the wind load analysis we have we have internal wind pressure as well as uplift on your thrust so with regards to uplift we have to make sure that we have a good connection between the thrust and the wall itself that's why at this at every at every thrust we will recommend a um hurricane ties hurricane ties so that will tie your beam not be that will attach your roof thrust to your top plate and then back to the foundation so if that's the case like um this one if if the if the um if the wall the the wall the weight of the wall can resist that whole uplift plus um because you have your sheeting right you have your sheeting and then you have your connection between the tablet and the stud also so that would uh, help with uh, transferring the load all the way down for your uplift and then you have your floor right your floor assembly and then if if ever this reaction here is just too high to resist just the um wall alone then that's the time you would need a mechanical uh, anchor between between uh, the stud the the bottom plate and the ring board or bottom plate here to the top plate of your lower load bearing walls for uplift so that it will not fly you know 
But for gravity, for, for dig load and snow load, we already have a load bearing wall here. Then transfer that to your stud. So from the truss, right, from the bottom cord to the top plate, and from the top plate to the stud, and then from the stud to the bottom plate below. Now from the bottom plate, you will press the sheeting, and then you have your rim board, and then your joist. Since you need to bypass that, then you have to provide a squash block. And then from there, from, from your rim board and squash block, down to your top plate at the lower bottom wall. And then from your top plate to your stud, uh, your stud to your bottom plate, then bottom plate to your slab or foundation. So that is the load path. Now, we already talked about the gravity loads, the downward forces, and the uplift. Now, we will also discuss about the load path with regards to lateral load, earthquake, and seismic. So, if this is your wall, and then this is your truss here, right? This is your truss, and then this is your uh, we'll just we will just talk directly the um, the other end which is with the center floor so it's uh, direct but it's the same concept so for example this is now your foundation and then this is your bottom plate this is your foundation this is your slab that one now when the load is applied like acting on your wall like that so your start will act like a beam it's the same as if you have a if you have a beam and then this is your this is your load so all you have to do is you have to make sure that this portion is supported you have a support right here as well as right here now if you rotate this one if you rotate this like 90 degrees this is the same as this one right so i remember when i when i talk about uh, when i when we um, design a, I think it was four-story apartment, and then for some reason I don't know when I when I arrived here when I joined the, the company, um, only few heard about the shear wall, and then when we discussed we have when we have the pre-construction meeting, the contractor asked me like, why do we have shear walls? Um, he said like. He understand because he he worked a lot of projects in uh, somewhere in I think uh, in the in the states. Um, what state was that? I think Ohio or yeah, that's what he said, Ohio. And then he said like I understand like uh, shareable there. And then here in Canada, um, it's only required in BC because there is seismic. Now that is a wrong. Um, assumption that uh, you don't need a shear wall because there's no earthquake activity here in the in the area. The shear wall is not just for seismic; it is for lateral force, and the lateral force could be from wind or for seismic. Now, in in the prairie area, in the prairie region here in the prairie, seismic do not govern for what when it's really light, but it's the wind that governs in the in the analysis. So. It's either uh, seismic or wind, you have to support that lateral load. So regardless of what governs, you don't, have, you don't say um, we don't need shear wall because there's no seismic here in Grand Prairie, but you, you, need that, you, have to, you have to know that that shear wall is not only for seismic, it is for the lateral, that's why it's called lateral force resisting system. Now if it is wind that governs the main wind resisting force system, or if it's seismic, then it's seismic force resisting system. So that's it. But that's the lateral, lateral force resisting system. So it could be the wind that governs or it could be the seismic. But it has to have a lateral force resisting system. Now, it, of course, it depends on the intensity of the, of, the, of the lateral force. If it's really small, then maybe you don't need a, a lot of fall downs or a lot of fasteners on your shear walls. Right? So, like I said, this is your stud applied you have your wind load or if it is uh if it is a seismic load it is it comes from the ground this is your base shear 
No, for seismic, this is your the 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 wind is is opposite uh, from the from the side. But the wind is applied, of course, at the at the at the open air, like uh, on on the top of your wall. But the seismic is applied um, at the base because that's the ground motion that uh, produces that shaking and then uh, eventually uh, causing like swaying of your uh, building. So that's why um, this load you applied, this is the base here, but you will do some calculations how much is the load acting. If it's like three or four floors, then there's a, cal there's a formula how to distribute that load over the height, this one. But that load comes from the ground. Unlike the wind load that is from the very top and then all the way down to the foundation. But the concept is the same, like uh, the same um, lateral force. So again, this is our stud, and then this is our wind load. So just imagine if you rotate that one, this is our stud, no? And then this is this has to be a support. We have to have a support, otherwise it will just keeps falling. So if it's the if it's the shear one, it will just tip over. So this is the the load, the wind load. So half of this half of this um, load. Because once it is uh, it, once it is applied on your stud, this is called the tributary. So half of this load, this one, half of this, so this one here will be transferred to the top, and then half of that will be transferred to the bottom. The same as this one. So if this is your stud, half of the load is carried by this support and half of that is carried by this one so if you rotate, if you rotate that one this is the foundation this is the roof right so that is the concept of like um how you apply the wind load now if you consider the whole structure if you now consider the whole structure so this is your this is your uh, um, floor layout or roof layout. This is your roof framing. Now, remember you have your studs right here, like every every 16 inches, right? So this is stud supports that load we talked about earlier. This one. Now, if you sum up that one, like the total half, all you have to do is basically this one. This will be a uniform load. At 16 inches on center, 16 inches on center, or you can just use 12 inches on center, it doesn't matter. Um, just because the spacing. Otherwise, if the spacing say 8 foot on center, then that's the time you you um consider a, the, the load on the stud as concentrated load on your um diaphragm. If 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 it's like uniform spacing like 12 inches on center or 16, then you can assume like a uniform distributed load. So Again, half of the load will be carried by the foundation, and then half of the load is carried by the roof. Now, if you look at the portion that is carried by the roof, it will also be divided into two. The, the left side will be transferred to this wall, like this one, this wall. And then half of that will be transferred to this wall. It's the same as if you have your uh, roof truss, right? If you have your roof truss, Half of the load, half of your load will be going to this wall, and then half of that will be going to this wall. So the same concept, if if it's like it's just vertical. The roof is horizontal, but the same the same way how the loads are applied. So again, so half of that load, so basically if this is your we'll do a we will do a, a 3D right and then this is your so half of this so we will divide this one into two so the load above will be carried by the top plate here transferred up and then the bottom half would be to the foundation now this is already foundation then just disregard that one because it's acted upon by it's resisted by the slab and then your footing itself and then you have the passive resistance of your ground if it's a foundation wall then that's fine just disregard that portion. What we are after is 
the portion of the load is transferred to your row. Now, this one, you have your uniform load here. Now, this load will be divided into two again, so that half of the load is carried by this wall, this one. And then another half would be is carried by this, carried by this wall, this one. So, it means that one-fourth of your load is acting on this wall, and then the other one-fourth is acting on this wall here. And then the other half is to the foundation, which is already fine. Otherwise, unless you have a basement, if you have a basement, then that load has to be transferred to the to your uh, floor there from. But if it's like foundation, like slab, then just neglect that part. So, we now have... We now determine how much is the load acting on this one. So that is one fourth of the total area that is acting on this wall. So when you design that wall, when you design that wall, so that is now called the shear wall. So this is now your wall. Now you have the load right here acting at the very top. This is the one fourth of the total load. Remember? So again. One half of the load, the entire load, is transferred to the foundation, this one, and then one half is to the roof. But this is like a, this is your roof diaphragm, and then it is acting as if it's a, a, a flat beam, and then supported by this shear wall here. That's why we transferred it directly to the wall, but the, 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 um, uh, what we call this one, the distribution is, if you have this, so if you have this uh, building, right? So one half is going down, one half is going up, and then it is acting on this um, roof diaphragm. So this is your roof diaphragm, this one. Now one half of that, one half of that is transferred to this wall, and then one half of that is to this wall. So that's why in right here I only put that it will be carried by um by that wall but it is through the roof there from and then transfer that uh so from the stud to the to the top plate and then your top plate is attached to your roof there from and then your roof there from is transferring that load to your side walls so that's why we have this side wall and then this is the load above now this load this will produce a what a rotation in that direction so that's why at shear wall this is say if this is going going to the left this will be this will be up left and this will be compression now since this is up left and if we don't have enough resistance to uh, resist overturning that's why at this joint we need the hold down so we need the hold down so if you if you go to um simpson strong tie i will just show you what is uh, uh hold down so say it's the u4 hold down so that one here see so that's the connection. So your your in stud in post, since we don't have enough resistance, assuming we don't have enough resistance, then from the in post we will have this mechanical anchor or um, hold downs, this one, and then anchor that one with this uh, 3D drags or anchor bolt down to your foundation. So you have a solid resistance. So if the if the I don't think the wind, if, if it's designed properly, I mean, you have to make sure also that you, the concrete can resist the entire, uh, for example, the total uplift is 1,000, but your total weight of your uh, foundation is only 500, then you are sure, then, you know, it won't work. So your foundation is, I mean, of course, foundation is really heavy, but uh, you know the idea. It has to have enough, like, resistance. So going back to our shear wall, so this is our shear wall. So again, this one, if, if the load is in this direction, then we, we need the 
cooldowns right here. Now, again, wind could be going to the left or going to the right. Now, if it's going like perpendicular to the board, then of course it will be resisted by the shear wall in the other direction. But this is like in plane, in plane uh, loading. So, since uh, our wind could be going west or going east, that's why we need hold downs at its corner. Because um, the wind could be going left or going right. And then to transfer this one here, now in, in steel framing, if, if this is like a steel structure, the typical uh, uh, main wind resisting force system would be bracing. So you will provide a cross bracing here. So if the wind is going in this direction, steel is good in tension. So this is designed for wind going in this direction in tension. Now, if this is uh, going in this direction, then this is the one resisting in tension. Or it could be the bracing is designed for both tension and compression. But you know the idea. So if this is still, then we have um, cross bracing. But since this is wood frame, we don't have that cross bracing. All we have is the sheathing. So this is our sheeting. Now this sheeting, if you look at the um, uh, wood design manual, you will get a different capacity for what kind of um, um, fasteners, if it's like um, uh, thin D or 3 inch nail or 2 and a half nails, and then the thickness of the uh, sheeting, if it's OSB or if it's a, a plywood. So it, it has different um, Capacity if it's um, Douglas fir, the stud, if it is uh, SPF or if it's uh, HF. So in in the manual, uh, there's a table there that you can uh, just select, you know, whatever is your thickness, sheeting thickness, the nailing, and then also the spacing. The, so the closer the spacing of your fasteners, the bigger the capacity of the shear wall. That's why, um, um. For shear wall, um, you have say three inch three inch nails at six inches on center. Then we have four inches on center. We have three inches on center. So whichever uh, whatever is the required uh, capacity, this one, this different uh, nail length and spacing have different capacity as well. We just compare the two. So if the for example, if this three inch nail at four in uh, six inches is say 100 pounds per foot PLF and then this 4 inches is 150 PLF and then your load is 125 so of course you will specify 3 inches at 3 inch nails at 4 inches on center with a capacity of 150 because your load is your load is 125 so um, so we already have that one. So we have your load applied at the very top. So it would be transferred through the sheeting and then down to your foundation. So that is the load path. So you just have to make sure that when you do the framing, you have uh, like you take this all like all this. Um, um, everything here discuss uh, into consideration so the load path um, the direction of your trusses if you have um, if you have um, openings so uh, I think that's it um, um, if you have any questions just uh, let me know because we have almost two hours and uh, I think the limit is two hours for uh, uploading this video so uh, we don't have much time we will discuss uh, uh, in the next video uh, please subscribe, uh, log in at work uh, on my Facebook page or uh, YouTube channel. Uh, bye for now.